It's been one year since the murder of George Floyd. One year since America hung on each of those nine minutes and 29 seconds. That moment, a blip and a lifetime, shook this country to its core and dispelled with cruel clarity any notion that black bodies in America were any safer from police violence on May 25th, 2020, than they were in 2014. 2015. Saturday morning, Walter Scott pulled over for a broken taillight. 2016. Video showed Alton Sterling on his back. The police officers say they thought he was reaching for a gun. I have to tell you, I do have a okay. firearm. Okay. I don't, don't reach for it, then. I'm, 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 don't pull it out. I'm not pulling it out. Don't pull it out. Or even months before we ever knew George Floyd's name. In the years since George Floyd's murder by a former Minneapolis police officer, we witnessed an American upheaval, born from black pain, but nurtured by a cross-racial coalition who said they had enough. Activists and allies made calls to reform or defund or reimagine the machine of American policing, and some cities were pushed in that direction. Others have fought to maintain the status quo. Politicians and police unions weaponized the defund movement and drew their thin blue line even deeper. In many ways, the machine continued to do what it was historically designed for, controlling black America. Yet there were glimmers of progress. Corporate America and Hollywood and so-called progressive politicians, for a moment at least, centered the value of black life. The George Floyd Justice in Policing Act was introduced in Congress, and the pangs of the pandemic and political discontent led to history being made at the White House with a promise. We've all seen the knee of injustice on the neck of black Americans. Now's our opportunity to make some real progress. We also witnessed the murder trial of Derek Chauvin, the former police officer who killed George Floyd, with all of its heart-wrenching testimony. And then his conviction, a unicorn in a justice system that almost never convicts police for killing black people. But was this justice or basic accountability? On the very same day, just minutes before that verdict was read, a police officer in Columbus, Ohio, shot and killed a black girl who was holding a knife. And we added her name, Micaiah Bryant, 16, to the list. But the system failed Micaiah long before this moment, before a cop opted for deadly force rather than de-escalation. Black girls, like her, are not often seen as worthy or redeemable or given the chance to make mistakes, even bad ones. Between George Floyd's murder and Chauvin's guilty verdict, police killed 203 black people in America. And after the verdict, the beat continued with Dante Wright and Andrew Brown Jr. So here we are, a year after those nine minutes and 29 seconds that changed us all. And black America's voice has gone hoarse from whispering and pleading and shouting for justice. The question we continue to ask is if now, in this moment, America is ready to listen. And if not now, then when? Good evening, I'm Tremaine Lee. This is Can You Hear Us Now, one year later. Since that day in May of 2020, America has been reeling from the shock of that initial violent act to the anguish that sent countless thousands into the streets in protest across the country. And when those guilty verdicts were delivered, some were brought to tears that a black family had finally tasted something close to justice. But one verdict does little to untether America from its roots, some 400 years deep and growing. So today, we ask the question, has the past year of protest and the push for reform bent America any closer toward justice for all? Or does justice remain a dream deferred for black America? To answer that question, we're joined by a panel of thinkers and doers, activists and policymakers who know intimately where we've been and perhaps where we're headed. I'm joined by Jelani Cobb, staff writer at The New Yorker and NBC News contributor. Anna DeVere Smith is an actress, professor, playwright, 
who created a Tony-nominated one-woman show about the 1992 Los Angeles riots. And freshman Democratic Congressman Mondaire Jones, who represents New York's 17th Congressional District. Jelani, let's start with you. This time last year, the country was starting to mobilize around the killings of Ahmaud Arbery, George Floyd, and Breonna Taylor. A year later, Dante Wright, Micaiah Bryant, Andrew Brown Jr., and so many others, all black, all killed by police. I want to ask you this, man. How much has actually changed in a year? Yeah, I mean, first off, I want to thank you for having this conversation. And, you know, I'll even cast this out more broadly. Uh, the first time that uh, Anna DeVere Smith and I met in person, we were on a panel talking about the death of Michael Brown uh, in Ferguson. Uh, and that was in 2014. And so we could say how much has changed in seven years. You know, we're still grappling with these same sorts of concerns. You know, that said, in my lifetime, you know, I've never seen a movement for reform have the kind of momentum uh, that we've seen come out of the George Floyd moment. Uh, the conviction of Derek Chauvin, uh, one, is highly atypical, uh, even in e egregious miscarriages of justice, uh, in cases where uh, police officers violate department policy, uh, which was what happened with Eric Garner, uh, or in just indefensible kinds of actions, we do not see police indicted. We do not see police convicted. And so uh, this is atypical, and it may uh, provide people some sort of blueprint uh, for how they want to move going forward uh, and when they encounter similar sorts of situations. You know, this certainly was a moment of first, you know, kind of like a unicorn moment. Black police officers almost never convicted, let alone arrested, for killing black people. And I want to go to you, Congressman Jones. You know, there was such hope, great hope, that in this moment, with this administration and this Congress, that America might be closer to getting major federal police reform. But some see those hopes fading with the impasse over the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, which passed the House but is stuck in the Senate. The bill would, among other things, ban chokeholds, get rid of qualified immunity for law enforcement, and outlaw no-knock warrants for federal drug charges. I want to ask you this, straight up, what needs to happen? And is the window on major reform simply closing? The bill would also create a national police registry uh, for folks who have engaged in misconduct. We know that too many people uh, engage in misconduct in one police department and then go and get hired by another one. And so this is an incredible bill. This It marks a watershed moment. And I remain optimistic that the Senate will pass a version, a version of the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, uh, and that the House would then pass the same. I have tremendous faith in the leadership of Karen Bass, who's negotiating, as you know, in earnest with Senator Tim Scott over in the other chamber. Uh, this is not something that would have even happened were it not for the movement of black for black lives uh, that really, I think, got newfound momentum last year with the murder of George Floyd and, of course, Breonna Taylor. And it's something that I continue to believe uh, will be the first of many success stories in the area of getting us closer to racial justice. I'm tired of folks only talking about racial justice in the context of policing. We know that systemic racism extends well beyond the policing context. It's the way that we fund public education in this country. Uh, it is certainly the way that we condition one's ability to get necessary medical care and how much money they have in their pockets. Uh, but this would be, if passed in the Senate, a major step forward. You know, Anna, sometimes I think these policy conversations are like a bridge to nowhere for a lot of ordinary, regular Americans. And I want to ask you this, given just how deep the roots of racism are in this country, is policy reform even the answer? Can we policy our way out of racism and white supremacy? Is real lasting change possible? Well, it, it's everything together, isn't it? We live in ecosystems. Um, and so, uh, you know, policy is critical, uh, as was just stated, education is critical. Art is even important just to sort of get people to the river and turn them over to the policymaker and the activists and the teachers. And so, you know, I'm actually very excited by this very disturbing moment because the windows for change, as you, you've already alluded to, are very short. But this is a very dynamic moment, and I'm seeing it have ripple effects every kind of way. So I'm a hopeaholic. Um, but I'm also a realist, and I do think that we are in a moment where it, which, the main thing is to to remain active and, and not think that the window is closed, to, to use our very last breath to make a difference, because when it does close, there will be a long time before we have a chance to do anything. 
Jelani, and it talks about the dynamic nature of, of protest um, and pushing, you know, movement building, right, and reform. Uh, but the systemic nature of racism is also very dynamic. And we know that the fuel of injustice in America is systemic racism, right? And President Biden promised to make tackling systemic racism central to his administration. And I want to ask you this. Where do you think he's succeeding in that effort, and where is he falling short? Well, I mean, I think that it's, it was significant that he even mentioned that such a thing as systemic racism exists. That's a, just the foundational thing, because we're having this dispute now, uh, as you can see people on the right who are attacking uh, all sorts of scholarship and all sorts of scholars uh, who have very meticulously made this point. Uh, but I think that really, uh, you know, early in the, his, his term, we'll, we will see, you know, what happens with the George Floyd uh, Justice and Policing Act, uh, you know, what happens with the voting uh, reforms that are on the table, uh, you know, the, the H.R. 1 uh, bill, uh, which would create reforms, and also the John Lewis bill, uh, which would re-enshrine uh, the Voting Rights Act, you know, all that's on the table. Uh, you know, what will come out of this infrastructure bill uh, and specifically the violence intervention funding, uh, which is a crucial component of this, as people are saying, some people don't like the, the term defund the police or they want to come up with other language, but essentially communities are trying to find alternate strategies of violence interruption uh, and to have that be a mechanism so that you don't always have to rely on police. Uh, that's significant. That's important if that stays in that bill. So there are an array of things that he will be judged on. They're all kind of uh, on the burner right now and waiting to see, uh, you know, what actually, what actually comes out of them. Thank you so much. Congressman Mondaire Jones, thanks so much for joining us. Anna DeVere Smith and Jelani Cobb, we'll see you later in the hour. After the break, calls for police reform haven't quieted down in the last year. We'll take a look at how some departments are doing it on a local level. But first, a look at the challenges facing reform on Capitol Hill. We must find a way to pass voting rights, whether we get rid of the filibuster or not. Historians do not agree it has no racial history at all. None. These talking points are an effort to use the terrible history of racism to justify a partisan power grab in the present. If all this takes eliminating the filibuster, another Jim Crow relic in order to secure the God-given rights of every American, then that's what we should do. An exemption to the filibuster for the purposes of protecting our democracy is not only logical, it is fundamental to who we are. More than a year after Breonna Taylor was shot to death in her own apartment. Good afternoon. Attorney General Merrick Garland says a wide-ranging civil rights investigation of the Louisville Police Department is underway. I think that it's necessary because police reform, quite honestly, is needed in near every agency across the country. For Breonna Taylor's mother, it's another key step towards accountability. Long before Breonna, it's something that's been needing to happen, so better late than never. Hey everyone, welcome back to Can You Hear Us Now, one year later. The Breonna Taylor case, as well as the George Floyd case, have put the spotlight on some police techniques and policies clearly in need of reform. As we've discussed, some of this is being debated on the national level, but is change most effective coming from the local level? NBC's Shaquille Brewster went to Charlotte, North Carolina, where the city's new police chief has enacted reforms that activists have been demanding for years. George Floyd's murder sparked strong demands for change. Changes to police training, procedures, and the laws that govern the institution. There's things in history that you can go back to and say when the country was tired enough of it, then the change came about. And I don't think the people in America right now are to that point. They're getting there, maybe. But one year later, experts say police reform is sweeping through the country at an impressive pace. To see things that are occurring on this level, on a national level, and also taking place not only just at the local and state level, it, it's, it's amazing. And I'll be honest, it's about time. <laughs> the Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department is just weeks away from beginning what it's calling a revolutionary retraining. It's putting the final touches on a new curriculum for the department's 2,300 sworn officers, training that will emphasize customer service. It doesn't necessarily have to be a bad experience with police officers. It might be a bad situation that they're in, but our encounter with them does not have to be a, a negative encounter. 
This emphasis on service shaped in the months after Floyd's death. As Congress debates federal legislation, lawmakers in nearly every state have introduced more than 3,000 policing-related bills. More than 30 have passed new police oversight and reform laws since May 2020. Common reforms include bans on chokeholds and neck restraints, updates to use of force and de-escalation policies, and new expanded body camera policies. Some jurisdictions have done more. Illinois' new law requires officers to provide an underlying offense when arresting a person for resisting arrest and ends cash bail by 2025. New Colorado legislation, considered the country's most far-reaching, allows officers to be sued for up to $25,000, ending the liability shield known as qualified immunity. Meanwhile, some states have reacted in the opposite direction. Georgia is now setting limits on cities and counties that try to slash police budgets. Police departments are also responding to the pressure. Charlotte is updating its early intervention system. The system uses an algorithm to analyze some 2,000 risk factors, flagging officers with the highest likelihood of having negative encounters with individuals. Our goal is to look at the totality of the officer and the totality of what they deal with and to recognize the pieces that we can affect change in. And if we create wellness and provide wellness and the opportunities for wellness, then our hope is the risk factors and liability go down on the other side. Community members, especially those impacted by police, say they want more. As someone who has lost her son mm -hmm. at the hands of police, when you look at the reforms that have been talked about so far, what do you think? That's progress. That's progress, but we still need more progress. You can't have officers that don't know how to engage the community. Even well-executed reform for them is just a bridge to a more dramatic restructuring. We've tried implicit bias training. We've tried uh, conflict resolution. Cr conflict resolution training. We've tried all of these different things. But you cannot reform what's in somebody's heart in the system of law enforcement here is not just here, around the country. It's almost unreformable. While some departments are trying to take on reforms, change is slow. A Yale analysis from 2020 finding no change in racial disparities in police shootings in the last five years. Black people and other people of color were shot and killed by police at rates significantly higher than whites. I'm joined by former Seattle police chief and NBC News law enforcement analyst Carmen Best, Marlon Peterson, host of the Decarcerated podcast and author of Bird Uncaged, an abolitionist freedom song and writer, director, and comedian, Trayvon Free. Carmen, let's start with you. The Washington Post had a story out this month that quoted experts saying that most of the 18,000 police departments in America are small, and that's why they're hard to reform. As a former big city police chief, does that sound and sit right with you? Why is reform so hard? Yeah, no, it doesn't sit right with me, because I don't believe your geography should determine the level of policing service that you get. I mean, just being from a smaller area should not mean that somehow you are more at risk uh, when you encounter a police officer. I am really an advocate for, believe in, um, setting some national standards so that no matter where you are in the country, in the state, in your city, your municipality, or your urban areas, or sub suburban area, um, that you get the same level of service that you know that there's going to be body-worn cameras, that you know the officers aren't allowed to use chokeholds, that you know they're not using no-knock warrants. If we can do that uh, on a national basis and create some national standards, I think that would be very helpful and move us a long way. Otherwise, you're dealing with 18,000 independent jurisdictions, and it's questionable uh, what can happen when you have that, that sort of system. Marlin, they're just, you know, too small to reform. What can they do? <laughs> they're too small out in the woods somewhere. Um, but I, I want to get serious. You've been on the other side of the justice system, incarcerated for years after a robbery in your 20s. It's an experience that many other young black men have faced. When you imagine police and criminal justice reforms, what does it look like to you? Well, I think uh, police reform looks like people like me not being afraid of them. I think mm -hmm. that's the first thing, you know, that, that, that my experience with incarceration is just my first experience with law enforcement 
in that capacity, but I had negative uh, uh, interaction with law enforcement since I was a, a young person before I got involved with anything. I think ultimately, here's the thing, is that from the ground that you sort of describe me as, um, but policy that, policy that are enacted, they're not actually applied on the street level. And that's the problem. The problem is ultimately the officer and, and individual interactions on an interpersonal basis. Trayvon, Marlon talks about that interaction, that day-to-day -day interaction between uh, black folks, black men in particular, and the police. And, and you now have an Oscar under your belt for your film, Two Distant Strangers, which focuses on this wild Groundhog's Day experience of police killing black people. Not long before Derek Chauvin was found guilty, Dante Wright was shot and killed right down the street. Do you see, with all of this, any hope amid the seemingly endless cycle of violence? You know, I, I, I want to see hope. I want to believe that there's a, a light at the end of the tunnel for us. Um, the Up until now, up until the reforms you guys were just talking about in your piece, you know, it didn't look good, and it still doesn't look great in the moment when you, you think about um, what's being done across the country in certain departments and where people are pushing back and where people are, are buckling down and making it more difficult to reform police departments. So you see that there's a divide in the country where we can't even really agree on a, a baseline level of rights that people should have when it comes to interactions with police officers. A baseline level of rights. Marlon, with that in mind, we have to talk about uh, the young sister, Micaiah Bryant, the teen girl who was killed by police in Columbus, Ohio. Now, law enforcement says she had a knife, and when you see the body cam footage showing the fight between her and other girls, it gets out of hand quickly. Um, I wonder, from your vantage point, could police have done anything differently, and how could your work as a violence interrupter have maybe saved her life? Yeah, definitely. Say her name. Thanks for bringing up Micaiah Bryant, without question. I think that, you know, in that situation, we know what, what, what we have from the video footage. But we also know that police had other opportunity, he had other things at his disposal to be able to sort of uh, get the attention to sort of uh, uh, de-escalate de 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 the situation. The ultimate problem is this, though, even in that particular case, is that there was an uh, assumption of that woman, of, of young Micaiah, this child not being childlike. She was a 16-year-old little girl, and I think that's partly that's what's lost in the equation here, that this adult officer saw this little girl as an adult and, and, and treated her such as, as in that capacity. The whole thing about uh, being a violence interrupter is about relationship building. What relationship did that officer have with Makai in that community before they entered in that in that particular uh, uh, situation? Wow. Carmen, there are now federal investigations into the Minneapolis the Police Department over the murder of George Floyd, same for Louisville and the death of Breonna Taylor. What happens when the Justice Department starts really taking a good look into these local uh, law enforcement agencies? And what comes next? And does any of it create meaningful, practical change? Yeah, well, the, the Justice Department coming in, I think, one, will make sure that um, any policies, procedures, tactics, you know, some you know, any of the culture that needs to be changed, they'll take a, a thorough look at it. You know, I, I was a chief in Seattle that was under a federal consent decree. I think a lot of good came out of that in many ways. Um, but, you know, they still have to build, as was said earlier, the relationships with the community. So they can come in and look at all the policies and the procedures and the training which is incredibly important and needed and, and plays a vital role. But along with that, there needs to be the capacity to build the relationships, as, uh, as was just talked about earlier. How well do you know the community that you're serving? How often are you out there? How do you know the people? So that's a real critical component as well. I personally do see light at the end of the tunnel. Carmen Best, Marlon Peterson, Trayvon Free, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Coming up next... Derek Chauvin faced accountability for murdering George Floyd. What would actual justice look like? But first, a look at one city that's making strides with good policing, but still has a long way to go. <laughs> What's changed? You can walk down the street with a $20 bill sticking out of your pocket and nobody will mess with you. People are being imprisoned in their homes. The good people you didn't see, you just saw the bad people that occupied this space. <laughs> and we just started to talk to people, not arrest people, not arrest our way out of these problems. It pushed the negative element away. Chief of Police wants us out here on foot. You know, make that connection with everyone out here in the community. Today. How are you? I'm doing well, doing well. We have good cops here, just like we have bad cops, right? But that's not the main focus. If you want to put focus on something, we need help. And, and right now, we're asking for it.
guilty so many times, so like my mind was like, did I just, hold on, did I hear that right? I can hold my hands out and I can show you the balance because today it happened for us. Yes, I am so pleased. Yeah, I expect the law, law enforcement agencies across the U.S. to redefine their training and procedures on how they handle these type of situations because they're going to continue to happen. We've made little baby steps. Um, towards um, something better, a better tomorrow, and a better future for our kids and grandkids. Guilty on all charges. That was the verdict for Derek Chauvin in a courtroom back in April. And you could see the relief in the streets in Minneapolis. Floyd family attorney Ben Crump saying, let this be the precedent where we live up to the high ideals and the promises when we say liberty and justice for all. But was this justice or just accountability that should have happened anyway? To help me unpack that question, I'm joined by civil rights attorney Lee Merritt, Jelani Cobb, staff writer at The New Yorker and NBC News contributor, back with us, and Dr. Youssef Salam, prison reform activist and one of the exonerated Central Park Five. Lee, I want to come to you first. Derek Chauvin was found guilty on all three counts. And for a lot of people, it felt like a huge sigh of relief because police officers are so rarely convicted of killing black people. But in some ways, this was a layup. America knew what it saw in those terrible nine minutes captured on camera. The facts in each case are different, but you've been engaged in this work for a very long time. Do you get the sense that the Chauvin verdict means maybe, possibly, we'll start seeing fair outcomes and more accountability? Well, as you said, it was a layup, but it was a layup for the bad news bears who miss layups all the time. And I don't expect that this one recent uh, conviction is going to change the policing culture that permits this kind of violence against black people. Um, we would need more systemic change, both in terms of training policy personnel, uh, but also a major cultural shift before this kind of conviction becomes the, the standard, the expectation. A cultural shift. Jelani, justice, if we've ever experienced it as black Americans, has been fleeting at best. And police are given wide legal latitude to kill and even, even wider social latitude when they kill us. Do you see any lasting meaning in the Chauvin verdict? And are we at any kind of historical inflection point? Potentially. Uh, I mean, so one of the things that's important to remember is that uh, this case happened in the midst of a pandemic. Uh, in the midst of a lockdown, where many people were in their homes with nothing to do but watch that video on loop. Uh, it was not an instance of a firearm uh, where the person could have made a wrongful split-second decision. This took nearly 10 minutes uh, for Derek Chauvin to kill uh, Mr. Floyd, uh, and it was on video. And so there were all these elements that made this atypical, made it different from the, the cases that you had seen in other instances. And I would hazard to add here, one thing that I think is very important is that I've spent about two and a half weeks in Minneapolis, in and out of George Floyd Square, which is the area where he died, has been renamed by that community as George Floyd Square. Uh, and they have a whole list of demands. They do not view uh, the conviction of Derek Chauvin as the culmination of all this. They have uh, Justice Res Resolution 001, uh, which has 24 demands that the community wants, uh, including the recall of the county prosecutor, uh, about a half million dollars investment in the community where he died, uh, full disclosure of information about six or seven other black people who died at the hands of the police, uh, and the full prosecution of all the officers involved. A lot of people forget that there were four officers who were there present and at various times holding Mr. Floyd down. Uh, and so there are still three more trials that are set uh, for later in the year, uh, and actually early next year. And so uh, that is, uh, there's a lot to be said before people can actually say whether or not this is a watershed. Dr. Youssef Salam, I want to come to you. You know, you were famously on the receiving end of a massive miscarriage of justice as part of what's now known as the Exonerated Five. You know just how wrong policing and the so-called American justice system can be. Talk a little bit about how law enforcement treats young black men and boys in particular, these two kind of different justice systems in America. Yeah, the, 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 the duality that we're, we're experiencing in America has always been there. I mean, we're talking about something when we think about the origin stories. We're talking about the, the creation of a police department that was birthed out of the emancipation process, right? And so when we look at people being 
pulled out of their cars by hair, by their hair, like a, a grandmother was, or families being told to lay on the ground, all the family members, the, the mother, the father, the daughters, the children, the babies. We're seeing the disparities and the, and the, and the real um, problem that we're, we're trying to overcome, right? And this problem is not a problem where we're saying, hey, look, there's a problem, right? No, this is really something that has been created and is working exactly as it was designed in the minds of the people who created it. Unfortunately for us on the receiving end, if you're black or brown, you'll always be seen as having a weapon because of the color of your skin, being judged by it and not the content of your character. And so we want what I call transformative change that allows for the kaleidoscope of the human family to be the people, not what we the people was considered back when the Constitution was drafted and created and ratified, and then the 13th Amendment being created as a part of that to make sure that slavery would continue by another name. And so what we're seeing is the overwhelming injustice we're seeing this in so grand a form because of social media. Social media has done a great job at letting people know what's going on. But back in 1989, 32 years ago, when we were vilified by the system, even now, right, George Floyd being a clarion call for us to make systemic change, they want you to think of it as an anomaly, as opposed to the whole thing, the norm in America. This is what's been going on and what has been going on and what continues. Anomalies and norms, that leads us right into this next question uh, with you, Lee. Uh, the news is still breaking, but it's disturbing news. Uh, you represent the family of Ronald Green, a black man in Louisiana who police at first said died after crashing into a tree during a chase. And later, they said that he struggled with troopers and died on the way to the hospital. We've heard stories like this time and again. And now the Associated Press obtained very, very problematic, disturbing video of the last moments of Mr. Green's life. And I wonder, how do we respond to that level of inhumanity? And in some way, are videos like this, as troubling as they are, a necessary in cases like this to push them forward? Let's not forget that the Minneapolis PD initially said that George Floyd's death was a medical incident. We've been fighting to have that video released for the past two years. Ronald Green died in 2019, in May of 2019, and the state of Louisiana has thrown up every obstacle possible to ensure that this video doesn't come out to the public, because they knew not only had the officers falsified reports and misstated the facts as it related to his death, but those responsible for supervising those officers, those responsible for prosecuting and, and investigating the facts, uh, also participated in a cover-up. And, and so now we expose the bad apple theory that, you know, uh, mistakes in policing are only the result of a few bad apples. Here, maybe a bad troop, troop F. Uh, that troop went on to brutalize other people and brag about it. Those officers were never arrested for this incident. Most of them are still on the job. Some of them have been arrested for other incidents where they have been exposed for brutalizing black men in the state of Louisiana. Uh, and, and the failure is not only on the part of those officers, it's the entire system. As Dr. Salam just, just described, they've created a, um, a system that works for them, that, that, that's designed to protect officers. Uh, it's, they're doing exactly what they're supposed to do, and now they're being exposed. The question is now, as a nation, how do we respond to it? Uh, do we demand justice for Ronald Green, of course, uh, but do we de demand also a restructuring of that entire system that facilitates this kind of result over and over and over again? Yusuf, there's the violence of police brutality and the carceral system, but there's also the violence of poverty, health disparities, and ongoing segregation. In your new book, Better Not Bitter, Living on Purpose in Pursuit of Racial Justice, you address the layered, complicated nature of life, death, and the system in America. Tell us about it. You know, the thing about it is that we have to weave very carefully from what was to what is and what will be. A lot of times they want you to think that, you know, the people who are in poverty were there because of some type of mishap in life, right? That they are cursed because of the color of their skin. When, when we look at things like redlining, somebody probably literally took out a red marker, marked up a map and said, okay, these areas are restricted and these areas are not. And so therefore they bulldoze large areas of land, put highways and byways in between them, segregated families and, 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 and communities because of that. 
And my book is an attempt not just to tell my story, right, but it's the story of being black and brown in America. It's the layers that we need to uncover on how we survive in this system and how we really tell the historical <laughs> facts of all things that have happened. And so it's important to look at things like poverty as a crime, right? It's the most violent crime that you can heap upon a people, because the in the poverty cycle is also what people place in their minds, what people consume in their bodies, and therefore, when we have crisis like COVID-19 or any other thing, it hits the black and brown communities the worst because of the ways that we have been socialized. Lee Merritt, Jelani Cobb, Youssef Salam, thanks for joining us. Up next, it's been a year of marching, fighting, demanding change. What does the future look like? What's ahead for the next generation after this? We've marched, we've shouted for justice, but will we see lasting change? After the Chauvin verdict, Darnell Moore wrote this in Vanity Fair. I don't know why I cried while watching an officer of the court cuff a former law enforcement officer who killed a black person, but I know how I felt, like a driver in a vehicle that has been stuck in a traffic jam for so long, who after having waited with impatient patience, finally begins to move ahead with a deep awareness that further along they might come upon traffic yet again. We're looking toward the future. I'm joined by actress and writer Anna DeVere Smith, Martin Luther King III, eldest son of civil rights leader, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and human and civil rights advocate, Dr. Sandy Darity, Samuel Du Bois professor of public policy at Duke University, and comedian and creator of Smart, Funny, and Black, Amanda Seals. Anna, let's start with you. Your play, Twilight Los Angeles, focused on the L.A. riots in the 90s after the police beating of Rodney King. We've seen protest movements like this before. Are you hopeful that things will be different this time, or are we doomed to stay on this loop of death, injustice, and protest? Well, I'd never say we were doomed, and especially not in the company on this particular uh, panel or with you. I think this has been a very dynamic year. It was worldwide. We saw um, we saw uh, statues come down. We saw uh, we see. Uh, 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 the, the, the promise of new policy. And as a professor, I see a, a huge movement inside of universities, not unlike that movement in the 60s. So I think the most important thing is for all of us who are still inspired, and the pandemic had something to do as well with the intensity of this, as we start to come out of our boxes and out of our homes uh, and back to our lives, to stay vigilant and to stay creative and to stay inspired to make a change in what will be ultimately a window of opportunity. But it's important that we remain active right now. Making a change and taking advantage of that window. Martin, with that in mind, I want to ask you this. You know, four in 10 U.S. adults think race relations are worse now than they were just a year ago, with white people uh, being more likely to say that than black people. Right, to say that things have gotten worse. And that's according to an NPR PBS NewsHour Maris poll. What's your take on how race relations have progressed or not? You know, it's very hard to, uh, to really quantify it in a, in a very short period of time. Uh, it is very it's crystal clear that racism, I believe and hope, is taking its last breaths, not just here in the United States, but in many places around the world, whether it's uh, Brazil where you have 60 million uh, Afro-Brazilians, larger than in the United States, whether it's in France or Italy, or whether it's in the UK, or wherever it is on the planet, even Australia. Because wherever there are indigenous people uh, who were there before anyone, they are always mistreated. So racism is a constant struggle and battle that has to be eradicated. Uh, you may know that my father wanted he called uh, racism one of the triple evils that he wanted to eradicate from our nation. He said racism, poverty, and he used militarism, which I've changed to violence. Uh, but it's crystal clear in this short period of time in this window, what I believe is there are more people determined uh, to get rid of the seeds of, of racism. We saw the largest demonstrations last year on the planet for civil rights. And whether it was in the United States in every state or whether it was on the European continent or whether it was in Australia or whether it was in South America on the African continent or in uh, Canada, 
many of them or most of them have signs that say Black Lives Matter. That's an, a consciousness awakening that we had not seen prior to that point. So my point is, I believe that positively we're going to continue to make progress. We have no choice, quite frankly. Amanda, we've seen this global movement, right? We've seen it be cross-racial, but it's also cross-generational, yeah, right? And we've seen a generation of young black folks, many who were just kids when Trayvon Martin was killed, who've been raised with the constant specter of highly publicized police and vigilante killings. They've marched, they've taken to the social media. But do you think America is a racist country, too racist to ever be fundamentally changed? Uh, <laughs> That's a big I, it, one. That's a big a one now. It's a big one. I mean, America is absolutely a racist country. It was founded on racism. So in order for that to change, the foundation has to change. And I wholeheartedly believe that. I think that, understandably, there are people who don't want to say that based on their positions. There are people who don't want to say that based on their fear of, you know, expressing hopelessness, et cetera. But at the end of the day, this country was built at a time when slavery was acceptable to many of the founding fathers and to individuals who were a part of the changing of this nation to America. And there, like, we, we are literally living in a country where slavery was written into law. So I don't think that anyone can dispute the fact that it was founded on racism. And that has been upheld. And we continue to see it upheld. All of these politicians make bold efforts to attempt to keep racism being discussed in schools. You know, we're seeing the number of legislation around voter suppression, et cetera. So this is not something that is, like, just kind of echoed by people who have, like, psychosis around racism. It is within the fabric of this nation. So I believe that the only way that the racism of this nation can be changed is if the actual foundation of what this nation is founded on is shifted. And, you know, South Africa at one point had to write a whole new constitution and get a whole new flag because they had to have a whole new direction. Well, I believe that that's what's going to have to happen here for that to actually be a part of our action plan. Dr. Derry, let's talk about that kind of purplefulness, right? Policy reform today won't likely shrink America's huge racial wealth gap anytime soon, right? And we've heard the calls for reparations growing louder and louder with each passing year. Is there any hope of justice and equality without first addressing reparations? I don't think that there's any significant hope of achieving racial justice in the United States without addressing the question of restitution and redress for black Americans who were descendants of uh, persons who were enslaved in the United States. But I, I would like to emphasize that the case for reparations is not one that is anchored exclusively on the horrors of slavery. That's merely the starting point. I think what's really critical in terms of understanding the rationale for reparations uh, for black Americans is the entire history of events that took place, including those that took place after slavery ended, particularly the failure to provide the formerly enslaved with the 40-acre land grants that they were promised, while the United States government provided one and a half million white families with 160-acre land grants in the Western territories of the country under the Homestead Act, uh, followed by waves of white massacres that took place in black communities where some measure of prosperity had been established. Those uh, waves of massacres not only took black lives, but resulted in the appropriation and seizure of black-owned property by the white terrorists. And then this process was succeeded by, and in the 20th century, uh, legislation that was intended to promote home ownership and build the middle class, which was discriminatorily applied, so that uh, black Americans were denied the same opportunities to become homeowners and to have equity build in their homes that white Americans were provided, both by the Federal Housing Administration and the way in which the GI Bill was executed. And so we have to think about federal policy lying at the heart of creating what you have written about, uh, the gaping racial wealth gap in the United States, where today the net worth of the average black household is $840,000 less than the net worth of the average white household. Or, correspondingly, black Americans who have enslaved ancestors in the United States are about 12 percent of the nation's population, but possess less than 2 percent of the nation's wealth. <clears throat>
And this is an injustice that needs to be addressed through uh, a program of reparations. Unless we address it, we're not going to be moving the nation in the direction of being a true democracy. And when I hear Dr. Darity kind of lay out uh, that history, you know, bleeding into our present, um, I can't help but think how important artists are in help, helping to shape our understanding of history and the context of the lives in which we lived. And we've seen a year in which artists have raised their voices in pursuit of justice. And I want to ask you, you know, what role should artists such as yourself play in reimagining what's possible in America in this moment? Well, um, I, uh, I always think about it as— um, an opportunity, you know, that we have as artists, but to walk in the company of others, right? I, I'm not on the ground. Um, I'm not saving lives every day, and I'm very clear about that. And so I think it's important to collaborate with the folks who are doing that. And I think, I don't think about us as important. I think of us as, pre as trying to be of service. Uh, to to folks in in all realms. That's really what we need to be doing. And you know, maybe we can work our way back into the schools sometime, <laughs> so the kids uh, themselves can be artists and express themselves in different kinds of ways. But mostly, I think about uh, longing for um, collaborations. Really, that's what we can do. We can I mean make noise. Uh, we can we can make noise. We can look great. We can attract attention. We can fill our work with content. We can move uh, hearts as as well as minds. But I'm so aware of the need for me to be in collaboration with folks exactly like uh, the individuals on this panel. That that notion of moving hearts, Amanda. You know, so much of what we saw in the Derek Chauvin trial was Chauvin's defense trying to make the trial about George Floyd's past. And you just had a conversation on your podcast, Small Doses about this idea of redemption. What role do you think forgiveness and redemption needs to play in our criminal justice system and, you know, how we just basically treat each other? Well, I think specifically in the case of our criminal justice system, there is just this idea that once you enter that system, that you are no longer valuable to society. And we see that in the disenfranchisement of our, you know, prisoners who come out and are back in society, but yet cannot continue to be a part of society in the same way as individuals who did not go into prison. We see that in their limitations and the, uh, their ability to get uh, loans for home ownership, to get insurance. I mean, there's a multitude of ways. And when we look at our prison industrial crisis, we see that that's not even considered. But of course, black people weren't even considered humans. And the prison industrial crisis is all about keeping black folks enslaved in, in another form. So it's no surprise. <clears throat> Can I can I say just one really fast thing on the end of, of that about of uh, uh, black folks not being human? Of course, art and humanities tries to has done an extraordinary job in the 20th century and in this century too to uh, fill in that gap by insisting on humanity, insisting mm -hmm. on our humanity. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to add that uh, one of the things that uh, we've attempted to and the work that uh, Kirsten Mullen and I have been uh, undertaking is to try to give measures to the immeasurable. And uh, I'll note that uh, in 1894, Frederick Douglass said, uh, there's no way you can come up with a sum of money that would be adequate to compensate uh, the individuals who had been subjected to slavery. But, he said, that doesn't mean that you should not try to make the effort to provide compensation for that experience. Martin, your father, uh, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., had a vision of a more just and fair world. With all the issues we've discussed today and that Dr. Darry and other panelists have laid out, are we closer to your father's vision uh, today, where we stand, or are we further away? <laughs> a very good question. Uh, yeah, I want to—I'm always— thinking about how to characterize reality in a positive way. Um, because just based on the conversations that we're having right now, it shows that we, we have a long, long way to go. Individuals have made great strides, but the vast majority of Black people are still languishing and struggling. But I, again, I'm, I don't want, I'm not pessimistic. I'm very <laughs> concerned. Uh, because, uh, as I said, these, these movements around racism exist all over the world. And European cultural supremacy is what the order of the day has been. And that's got to change. We have got to have a history that talks about what happens with black folk 
and white folk and, you know, Native people. Uh, from a conclusive standpoint, every day that we're in school. If we're able ever to accomplish that, maybe we'll help create a different America and perhaps even a different world. There is no way for me to measure my thanks uh, for having you all on this panel, but I will try. Uh, Anna DeVere Smith, uh, Dr. Sandy Darity, uh, Martin Luther King III, uh, Amanda Seals, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I hope what some say about the arc of the moral universe is true, that it's long, but that it bends toward justice, because the patience of black America is wearing thin. And if this past year has taught us anything, is that America remains slow and lumbering when it comes to change. But it's also shown us that America does indeed move when pushed, and that when Americans raise their voices, the echo can move mountains. Thank you so much for joining us, and good night. Hey, NBC News viewers, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.